Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. My guest today is Fergus Brady. He is the archive manager of the Guinness Storehouse. And I think that for anyone that loves Irish history will want to hear this interview, but also anybody who's thinking about going into career in history and doesn't know the possibilities of what that could look like, the people at the Guinness Storehouse, you guys have one of the coolest jobs in history that I had no idea existed before I got there. (laughs) Yeah. How did you end up becoming the archive manager of the Guinness Storehouse? And what is the Guinness Storehouse Archives? Um, So the archive really is the repository of of Guinness history um, from our founding founding document, which is the lease that Arthur Guinness signed in 1759 on New Year's Eve that year. Arthur was our founding father, and on a New Year's Eve that year, he signed a 9,000-year lease for St. James Gate Brewery. So incredible period of time, and that's our that's our first document and our oldest document here in the archive. So really, we're the inheritors of a great tradition of record keeping within the Guinness Company. So um, the archive has been established for for almost twenty years now, but um, over the years, there's been so many records kept to do with diverse functions within the brewery, whether it's through brewing itself, engineering, marketing, sales. Um, our iconic advertising campaigns. So when the archive was established formally about 20 years ago, um, the archivists were, were tasked with making that more accessible. Um, at that time, the Guinness Storehouse opened as a visitor attraction, and the archive was centrally involved in helping design the ex- exhibits and helping uncover stories within the archive collections that we could tell. So really, it's developed from there. So I, I've been working here for, for three years, um, almost now. So really, I, I got into it um, from from my background studying history, um, my history in Trinity, and then after that, I did a master's in archives management um, here in Ireland in, in UCD. Um, there's only one archive course um, in the country, and there's only twelve oh, wow. archivists qualifying each year. So it's a very niche. Um, yeah, it's a very niche uh, profession here here in Ireland. Um, and since then, yeah, I've been lucky to get get some really nice jobs. I, I worked in the National Archives of Ireland for two years. I worked in the National Library of Ireland and the Royal College of Physicians. Um, and then three years ago, I, I landed what, what a lot of people would, would think of as the, the, the dream job, which is which is um, Guinness Archivist. And since then, I've progressed to, to, to being the archive manager. So it's a really good job. It's really varied. We work with a lot of people, whether it's you know the, the staff here in the Guinness Storehouse. We do a lot of training. Um, in the history, we're always uncovering new stories. Um, at the moment, I'm involved in designing three new exhibits, um, two, one of which is in the storehouse and one of which is actually in America. Um, we're opening a new brewery and visitor experience in Baltimore. Oh, cool. So, yeah, it's really cool. It's our first, it's our first, um, it's our first brewery in America since 1954. Um, and it's going to be, as I said, not only a brewery, a working brewery, but it's also going to be a visitor experience or something similar to, to the Guinness Storehouse. Um, so that's, that's keeping me busy at the moment, um, telling that story of Guinness, of Guinness in America specifically. Um, and we're also doing a lot of work in advance of St. Patrick's Day. Um, we're rolling out walking tours of the, of the area of the, the Guinness Storehouse, with the area known as the Liberties. Um, and... Historically, um, we, we've been here since 1759 in the same area, um, and Guinness has a huge impact. Has had a huge impact on the area, whether it's the employees that have traditionally lived in local area, to buildings. A lot of a lot of buildings built by the Guinness Company and a lot of um, philanthropy, benevolence. So we're doing walking tours of the area, um, for 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 the week of St Patrick's Day, and um, that will be offered as part of the wider St Patrick's Festival, which rolls. Uh, is rolling out across the city so looking forward to that so that's interesting that you guys chose baltimore and not boston because when i think of like in the u.s uh if you want to go to a crazy st patrick's gig you go to like new york or boston and i actually went to boston for st patrick's day yeah 
I want to say like 2009. How did you guys decide that Baltimore was going to be where your new American heart was? Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it was probably quite a practical consideration. Um, we actually, we, our our um, parent company are called Viaggio, and it's a mass, it's a it's a multinational alcohol um, brand. So we have a lot of brands under under Viaggio, such as Johnny Walker Whiskey um, would be one of the most famous ones. Bailey's, Smirnoff um, Vodka, another one of our brands has been Seagram's Whiskies which was produced okay. in Baltimore, actually, um, just on the, in the suburbs. Um, there's a suburb called Rie, um, in which there's an old Seagram's distillery. So that's been in, oh, cool. in, our, in, in, in the possession of, of Diageo since, since the merger, which created Diageo in 1997. And that's been repurposed now, the old Seagram's distillery, as, as the new Guinness Open Gate Brewery and Barrel House. Well, that's cool that it has a historic twist to it, even yeah. if it's... Part of a slightly different legacy. I still, I think that's interesting. Absolutely, like one of one of the things, one of the stories we're going to tell in the new, in the new building is its is its history, its former history as the Seagram Distillery. It's actually the first. It was actually the first distillery um, in the states to open after Prohibition in 1933. That's a cool story in itself. Um, and one of the stories, yeah, one of the stories was saying this this place has been a, a really great place to have a drink for, for a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, listeners, if you can't make it to Dublin, which you should because Dublin is amazing, yeah. but you can make it to Baltimore, uh, that opens soon. So Absolutely, to yeah. That. It's going gonna, gonna, gonna to open up this, this summer. That's yeah. amazing. Um, oh, cool. Actually, I'm going to be in uh, Philly this summer for a conference. So uh, yep. if I end up going to D.C. to see my friends, I might try to swing by. That's awesome. So let's talk about the storehouse, because like you said, the area that it's in is important. And it's kind of an accident of history that this particular building is the building that the Guinness storehouse is is hosted in. Mm. But even though the the Guinness storehouse is a modern, relatively new tourist center, it's in a historic building that is still connected to the history of Guinness. So how how was it built and what purpose did it serve before it was so yeah, it was it was erected uh, between between 1902 and 1904. So it's it's got its own history. It's actually quite an historic building. Um, it's it's a it's a preserved structure. So it's on the list of preserved structures um, in, in Dublin. Um, and its original use was a fermentation house. So the, if you're wondering why it's called storehouse, it's not because we actually it wasn't a storage area as such. The word store. Um, in brewing terminology, means to to add yeast. Um, so yeah, so adding yeast is one of the key components of the brewing process, which happens near the end of the brewing process, where the unfermented beer or the wort um, is fermented by by the yeast. Um, so initially, that's that that was the use of the building, where um, you had these massive um, tons where. Yeast was pitched in to ferment the beer um, before it went out for for maturation, um, and then eventually dispatch. So that was the that was the initial use of the building from when it opened in in 1906 up right up until the late 1980s, 1988. The building itself is actually interesting architecturally. Um, it's reputedly the first steel frame building in in either Britain or in Ireland to be built in the Chicago style where the, the walls act as a barrier to the elements with steel girders forming the main structure of the building. So the walls aren't actually structural at all. They're just to keep out the, the, the rain that we have all the time here in Ireland. It's actually <laughs> the steel girders that you see throughout the building, which are, which are structural. Um, so it's reputedly, it's, we're only seven stories high. Um, so we're definitely not a skyscraper in American terms, but it was actually the first skyscraper in in. In that type, uh, in built in that style in either Britain or Ireland, and um, the second, oh, wow. one, yeah, so the second one was the the Ritz Hotel in London. So, so really important actually from a, from an architectural point of view. And um, so, as I said, it, it 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 operated for that original function of of fermenting the beer for up until 1988, and then a, a decision was made to to close the building and um, it become unsuitable for the the modern brewing processes. Um, and then just just over just nine years later in 1997, plans were were accepted to develop the market street, the the, store, the storehouse into a a visitor center for use by the general public, 
We actually had another brewer, um, another visitor centre before that called the Hop Store, um, but it was reaching capacity, and we were we, it couldn't accommodate the amount of visitors that that we were getting. Um, so it was a three-year project to develop it into the home of Guinness, um, and it opened to the public in December 2000. So we've been open now. now- for, yep. Yeah, you guys are actually, um, I think this might surprise people, but you guys are like the number one tourist destination in Ireland. And yeah. people think of like all of the famous historic places that um, people would want to go, but each of those have, might have different draws to different types of people. But it seems like most people who come to Dublin want to go to the storehouse. Absolutely. Yeah. So as I said, we're, we're the top tourist attraction in Ireland. Um, last year in 2017, we welcomed 1.71 million visitors. Um, so each year we're growing and each year we'll be beating the record that we had uh, the previous year. This year, we, uh, the U.S. has actually, for the first time, become our, our largest market um, in terms of visitors coming into the storehouse and um, surpassing the U.K. And we can see all sorts of growth, like China and Hong Kong are, are massive growing markets for us in terms of in terms of visitors, um, and as you said, a lot of people come here. Um, they they may have heard of Guinness, but actually, twenty percent of our visitors taste the first Guinness at the Guinness storehouse. They've never drunk Guinness before. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I so Guinness is one of those drinks, and um, I imagine that it will change with the brewery in Baltimore. But Guinness is one of those drinks that I very much drink when I'm in Ireland. I get super excited to have one. Yeah. I drink it like every day that I'm there, and then yeah. I don't really drink it the rest of the year. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. and I'm telling you this, and I know you might be like horrified, but it's just like I think of it so much connected with Ireland that I forget. Yeah. Sometimes, like when I'm in other parts of the world, that Guinness is an option. Yeah. And so I think that for me, one, knowing that if I'm in Philly or DC, that it's actually being brewed in Baltimore, I'll mm. probably drink it. Yeah. I'll probably drink it a lot more now when I'm on the East Coast. Yeah. But two, it's just, it's just so intricately connected with Ireland that depending on where you come from, it may not be a drink that people think of. And so it makes sense to me that a lot of people would try it for the first time and then go home and want to either go back to Ireland and drink more or drink more at home. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about, it's about, for us, it's about creating brand ambassadors um, who, who can, you know, if, if it's their first experience of, of drinking Guinness or if it's their, their umpteen time, you know, we, they can learn more about Guinness here. They can learn about the brewing process, the advertising um, and enjoy a fantastic point in, in the gravity bar, which is at the top of the building. Uh, fantastic 360 degrees. So let's talk about the story of Guinness because mm. one of the reasons that I really like, I knew that I liked drinking Guinness in Ireland. I've been to Ireland twice. I spent 10 days there last year. I spent two weeks there. No, I spent 10 days there in 2016. I spent two weeks there in 2017. Mm. I knew that the second I got off the plane, I wanted Guinness and literally had one in the airport. Yeah. But I did not realize the actual extent of the history, um, how far you guys go back and how continuous a line mm. things are. And, and so... And, you know, let's talk a little bit about the the family and how Mm. Guinness was founded. Yeah, so I mentioned a little bit before, Arthur Guinness was our founding father. Um, So very much a great hero in terms of the band history. Um, So Arthur Guinness, um, he was, there's a lot of myths about him, a lot of them untrue. But what we do know is that he was born in 1725. Um, He was born just outside of Dublin in a town called Selbridge. And his father was a guy called Richard Guinness. And Richard, um, he was a steward on a local estate. One of his duties was to supervise the brewing of beer for the tenants on that estate. So we presume that Arthur learned the art of brewing. Um, in 1756, um, when he, he, he was in his 30s, 31 years old, Arthur um, made his first big move in life by going to a neighbouring town called Leakslip and opening a brewery there with his brother, using a legacy that he'd been left in a will of £100. And then in 1759, three years later, he, on New Year's Eve, he came here to St. James's Gate, which was actually, a, 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 there had been a, a brewery existing on the site for for about 100 years. And he signed that incredible 9,000-year lease for that brewery um, at St. James's Gate and immediately started brewing beer. 
Um, what what is surprising to people is when he started brewing, he didn't brew the black stuff that we know nowadays. He, he actually brewed red ale, and then in the seventies, oh. yeah, so that's surprising. Um, in seventy in the seventeen seventies, he started brewing a new beer that originated in London called Porter, um, and the reason it was called Porter was that the people who originally drank it in London were were porters, and um, the guys who moved around vegetables in markets. Um, oh, and, and various, that's amazing. And, and various things like that. Um, it was becoming popular in Dublin. Art, so Arthur sh- um, saw an opportunity to brew this new darker beer. Um, in 1799, he, he stopped um, brewing ale altogether and concentrated on porter. And that's where, from, from that decision, then develops the, the dark Guinness. Um, the stouter type of porter became known as, as stout and Guinness very much became the the quintessential stout and is, is now the the number one stout in the world. Um, you know, just over a hundred years after Arthur took out that lease, um, in the time of his his great grandson Edward Cecil Guinness, we'd actually grown to be by um we'd actually grown to be the biggest brewery in the world and the biggest private employer in Dublin and you know, renowned as a great employer within the city. We can see we can see Guinness being exported to England in 1769, and actually just last year we we celebrated the 200th anniversary of our first export to the USA in October 1817. Oh, wow! Um, so I think when you were over last year, I was probably not here because I was actually at those events um, in the state. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, really great history. Um, in 1827, we we showed up in Africa for the first time. We're going to be celebrating that anniversary in a few year, in a few years' time. Um, so yeah, really, really great history, really varied, um, and very, very entwined with the history of Ireland, I suppose. So, as your your work in the archives, I know that um, I met one of your colleagues uh, uh, who is out on maternity leave, I believe, right now. So, but when uh, she she showed me around and. Some of the stuff that she was telling me about is just some of the work that you guys uncover about the history of the country yeah. through the documents of your company, mm. which is interesting because, I mean, it makes sense. A lot of historians look at, you know, the documents of regular workers and, mm. and you know, hiring and those kinds of things. But what are some interesting things that you guys have discovered about Ireland through the Guinness Archive? Yeah, I mean, in, in the in the last number of years, there's been a big um, focus in Ireland on the decade, what we call the decade of commemorations. So 100 years ago, some pretty major events happened, among them the, the First World War uh, between 1914 and 1918, the 1916 Rising, which was you know, a rebellion against English rule, which led on to a, a war of independence and eventually the independence of of. 26 out of the 32 counties of Ireland in 1922 and subsequent civil war. It was a very, very turbulent decade. And Guinness being here in, in, in Dublin was not immune to those changes at all. Um, actually, just, just late last year, um, we did a piece of research with a local, um, in collaboration with a local history group around two Guinness boats, which were sunk by German new boats during the, during the First World War. Um, Two boats, one of them called the WM Barclay and the other one called the SS Hare. Um, 12th of October 1917, the Barclay was hit by a torpedo just outside of Dublin um, from a German new boat. Five of the crew oh, died. Wow. Yeah, five of the crew died. Nine were saved. And actually, there's an anecdote from one of the survivors called Thomas McBlue, um, who said that the, the Barclay was doing their best to go down, but the barrels of Guinness were fighting their way up through the hatches. And that's how. <laughs> he actually grabbed onto one of those, so you could say Guinness saved his life. Um, so that was that was a really poignant story and something I didn't know about too much until we did a bit of, of original research around it. The SS Hare as well, just two months later, on the 14th of December, was torpedoed by a German submarine, um, and 12, 12 people lost their lives as well. And it fits into the wider story of... of Guinness men volunteering for for service in the British Army during the Second World War, uh, during the First World War, um, about eight eight hundred Guinness employees, um, right the way from top management down down to labourers ser- labourers served in the sec- in World War One, 
in the British Army. Um, and we have a really fantastic document here um, in the archive called the, the Roll of Honour, which lists the name of all of those. Um, some of the some of the names are actually struck true in red, and that's 103 of those guys who never actually came back. So oh, wow. incredible. Um, and yeah, shows how Guinness tied into that history. What are what were the lives of the workers like, kind of throughout the years? Yeah, I mean Guinness. Uh, I mean when I when I got the job here in Guinness, um, my my wife's uh, grandparents they're still they're still um, still alive and they're they're into their nineties, and for them I'd made it in the world because <laughs> it, it, you know before I was doing some sort of a weird little niche thing. But I got a job at Guinness, so that was good for them. And they knew that their granddaughter was going to be okay. <laughs> and that, that kind of gives you an indication about how the people in Dublin um, viewed a job in Guinness. And it's because Guinness was such a great job over the, and it has been, still is, thankfully, but it has been such a great job over the years. Um, you know, we, we have great records here in the archive of, of personnel. We've actually got 20,000 personnel files here in the archive which are extensively used for, for genealogy, family history. Um, so really great resource. But when you look into those files you can, and, and the wider personnel files, you can see what a great job it was. You know, uh, labor, um, workers were paid 10 to 15% higher than, than the normal average industrial wage from, from the late 1800s onwards. Um, you know, we had free, free medical care, free, free meals, um, non-contributory pensions 30 years before the state pension actually kicked in um, and this really vibrant social scene in the brewery you know by, by the, the early 1900s we the biggest private employer in the city um, and by about 1930 one in 30 um, Dubliners actually depended on the Guinness Brewery in some way for their livelihood so a really good oh, wow. job yeah um, you know, there's a local tale about that the that the local women in the old women in the in the in the local neighbourhood of the Liberties would encourage young girls to get themselves a Guinness man because he was worth money. <laughs> he was worth money either alive or dead. <laughs> <laughs> because if 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 the man died in employment, his pension was still paid out to his dependents. So I did an episode about the Dublin Literary Pub Crawl. Yep. And in talking with uh, Colm on that episode, he talked about how prohibition actually affected the Irish whiskey trade mm. um, negatively because it was exported so much to the United States. Yep. Did prohibition in America affect Guinness? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was a tough one for us, definitely, because Guinness um, in America was growing quite, quite steadily before, before prohibition. Um, so definitely impacted upon our trade. Luckily, we 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 had um, other emerging markets. Um, Britain was growing all the time during that period for us, um, and we we're expanding into markets which are abs- absolutely huge markets for us now in in Africa, Southeast Asia. So luckily, Guinness, um, unlike Irish whiskey, was able to ride that one out until until the repeal of prohibition. Is there any particular reason that you think? Guinness survived while Irish whiskey was hurt so badly? I think I, I'm no expert on Irish whiskey now, but um, I think Irish whiskey was very, very dependent on the American market and wouldn't okay. wouldn't have expanded into those other markets that Guinness had a foothold in, in, in places like Africa and Asia. Now, during the rest of the 20th century, like specifically maybe around World War II, um, Ireland was t- technically neutral in World War II, correct? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah how d- how did World War Two affect Guinness? Not not as um, severely as war, as the First World War. Um, okay. The First World War was a difficult time for us because there was there was a lot of um, restrictions on exports because of the wartime situation. Um, and our biggest market was was the UK was was England and Scotland um, and Wales, Britain. Um, so that was, it was difficult to get get our product across even across that that short. Um, slip of water in between Ireland and Britain um, as the story I, I told you about the torpedoing of ships uh, demonstrates but actually by, by the time um, the Second World War had come around we actually had a brewery in London um, in, in Park Royal it opened in 1936 so that was able to supply Guinness to that market in Britain um, however um, in terms of the men that went to fight 
Um, because Ireland was neutral, we didn't have as many going from the the, the, the brewery here at St James's Gate um, to fight the British Army, although there were, there were a few. Um, but we did have large-scale um, volunteering from our, our brewery in, in Britain. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of Guinness men went to fight in the British Army. Were those workers replaced with more women, or how did how did the sto- how did that brewery go on? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of a lot of women brought in, and also people on temporary contracts to 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 fill the gaps. Um, but a bit like in the First World War, they, the men who went off the fight, they were still paid half of their wage, um, even while they were away in the army. To, in addition to their army wage. Um, and there's a good story in the Second World War of uh, how um, the, Guinness, the Guinness Company, um, the British soldiers who, who were in France in, in 1939 at Christmas, they were sent um, a bottle of Guinness and a hamper um, as a Christmas present the whole way to France in, 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 as a sort of a nod to home and a little, a little bit of a reminder of what, what they were missing. <laughs> now, um, one of the things that I think is interesting about Guinness is like I traveling around to historic places. I go to a lot of places and drink like their local, you know, they ha- they'll have like a local drink that's important. So in Bulgaria, it's Rakia or and, you know, and we did an episode on Bordeaux and how Bordeaux got its wine or yeah. um, you know, like regions of Portugal and Spain that are wine. But Guinness is one of the only places in the world where I can think that like the national drink is also one company. Yeah. How does that affect you all in terms of your sense of like your sense of your place in history? And also what do you then turn around and owe the country of Ireland for making you all that national drink? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 a unique position that we're so synonymous with with the country. Um, I think Guinness has been great at giving back to Ireland. Um, you know, in, in terms of right through from the start with Arctic Guinness, it's been a lot of um, philanthropy, a lot of social initiatives that Guinness has supported. Um, you know, one of one of the one of the things I do quite often is I work with with our corporate relations team with various outreach um, programs in the. In the local community, such as that commemoration of the the First World War ships that was part of our outreach program last year. Um, but in terms of, sorry, the second part of your question. Oh, just I mean, what do you what do you guys see as your like legacy that you need to give to Ireland as a thank you for that position? Because that's so special, right? Um, mm. I I really can't. I I can think of some brands that wish they were that. But I can't think of any that actually are that besides Guinness. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of legacy, that's something that we work quite, quite, um, quite hard at here in the archives. Um, we're actually the only corporate archive in Ireland that is fully open to the public, and one of the reasons, the rationale behind that is that we're so entwined with the history of Ireland. It makes sense for us to act essentially like a public archive. Uh, in terms of opening it up, in terms of giving people access to our records, you know, facilitating their family um, research. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great. And uh, in terms of social initiatives, like you can see it here every day, like we, we still have a free meal, meal allowance, which is really, really nice. Um, but actually, when you go for your meal um, here in the brewery, um, the canteen is absolutely huge. We still have a, a, a workforce of over a thousand people here in the brewery. Um, and it's the one place that everybody goes at, at lunchtime. But w- a, a big cohort you can see there is actually pensioners as well. So people who oh. work, people who worked in the brewery, can still come in, um, even though even if they're long retired, can still come in and get their free meal. So that's really nice, and it it shows how the company has viewed the workers and has viewed the community over the years, and and is still interested in giving giving back to them. Now. If somebody was coming to Dublin and they wanted to visit the storehouse, what could they expect that visit to be like? Uh, what What's the kind of balance of trying Guinness and learning about Guinness? Yeah, I mean, I think the the exhibit is really well set up. You know, it's 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 a good combination of information of history, um, of information about our advertising over the years and. But there's also a great element of fun, um, I think, within the exhibit as well um, and, the, and the visitor experience. So 
when you come in, you start off with the, the story of Arthur and the lease, and you learn about that. You progress through our, our ingredients floor, where you can see the, the four main ingredients in Guinness, which are, which are water, yeast, hops, um, and roasted and barley. Um, and one of the new things we, we've developed is our new brewing floor, um, which is on the first floor, which, which calls out what, what makes Guinness so unique, which is the roast of barley, which makes our beer so dark the Guinness yeast, and also the, uh, our nitrogenation story. We're actually the first beer in the world to, to introduce nitrogen to, to the beer, which is, mo- which is much copied now. Um, <laughs> you see our transport section, Cooperage as well, it's really popular, um, and our world of advertising, which is always um, a point of interest. But then as you progress up through the floors, you, you get the point, you get the opportunity to pour your own pints as well on the fourth which um, is really fun it's and yeah not harder than i thought it was going to be but yeah. more serious than i thought it was going to be it's but quite it was really fun <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah and it's it's something i think people take back with them um you know pouring a pint of guinness is you know there's, there's more of a skill to it than i think pouring most other beers so um definitely that's a that's a fun part of it um, it's something that's ingrained into, into the Irish psyche, how to pour a pint of Guinness. But, um, so it's great that we're able to share that knowledge with, with our visitors. And it's all crowned off then by by um, a visit to the Gravity Bar, which is our full 360-degree um, view of, of Dublin from, from the top of the Guinness storehouse. Um, and actually, just last year, we announced plans to double the size of the Gravity Bar, a new £16 million Euro, um, investment in, into, the, into the building. And I think that's one of the reasons that the Guinness Storehouse has remained um, at the top of of the market here, that we keep reinvesting in the building. Um, as I said, I'm I'm in, very involved in the design of a new exhibit here in the storehouse. So that's going to going to going to be coming on stream this year as well. So, um, yeah, it's cool and it's, it's it's always changing and it's always moving with the times. Um, I think more and more in in the last few years we've moved with the times in terms of. Um, you know, audio visual um, technology and how people, what people expect of that as well. So, so yeah. One so, thing I didn't think of when I was there, because I was there on a, um, I was there on like a sponsored tour with uh, Fall to Ireland. Mm-hmm. So I was there with the tourism board and it was all adults. But if a family is coming into town, is there anything there for kids or sh- is this an adult only experience? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously we're, we're an alcohol brand. So, um, <laughs> we need to be we need to be careful about that. Uh, yeah, it, it is. Our you can come into the storehouse with with your family, and that's fine. There is there's reduced rates for for anyone under the age of of, of eighteen. Um, but obviously they can't partake. Um, you you need to be over eighteen to to take a drink here. And yeah. um, we do provide um soft drinks. Um, and I think the story as well is is very compelling. You know, the the advertising section in particular is is um very interactive and a lot of fun so i was just thinking of that because so many times i think ireland is a family destination and it's not like there's always child care available so no. i you know i i don't travel with children i don't have children so sometimes i forget to think of yeah. uh what that would be like so that's interesting that there's still stuff for them to do and that they can have a, a soda instead Absolutely. <laughs> yeah so if somebody was coming to Dublin specifically for St. Patrick's Day and they wanted to come to the storehouse, what would they expect? They can expect a lot of fun. Um, so <laughs> we, we, we put on an, an additional offer for, for St. Patrick's Festival. Um, so as I said, I'm, I'm very involved in doing some, there'll be an added offer of walking tours around the area, Guinness teams, um, where, where we, um, for, for four days around St. Patrick's Day, we'll be doing that. Um, in the storehouse itself, the there's added um, offers of a lot of music, um, live music brought in, our traditional bands. Um, we have a band coming in this year who are very, very well renowned in Ireland called the Riptide Movement, really great performers. Um, we also have a huge amount of marching bands coming in, from a lot of them from the States. So the showpiece event in, in Dublin and in all towns and cities around Ireland on Sebastian Day is the parade. Um, so that happens in, you know, it starts off at 12, 12 o'clock in the day. But afterwards, we invite a lot of marching bands in here to the storehouse and they just line up in the lobby and, and play their 
play their instruments and just lends to a lot of a lot of fun. Um, I know this year we're we're doing a, an activation around the Guinness Tash as well. Um, so you know when you take that first pint of Guinness and um, the first sip, you you know you end up with this frothy, um, the frothy head of the beer on on your on your lip. So you know we, we had a fun a fun thing last year as well, where you know what what type of Guinness Tash do you have? You know it, it shows which type of drinker you have. And lots of other, you know, fun fun elements like that. So definitely, um, you know, once you've gone to the parade, I think come to the Guinness Storehouse, it's a really cool place to be. Um, I think last, last year, the day after St. Patrick's Day, we actually set a record for the amount of people who came, came into the building in terms of oh, wow. the daily statistics. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, Fergus, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing uh, the history of Guinness and how it's tied to the history of Ireland, which is something that uh, before I got to the storehouse, I really had no idea. And I really uh, just thank you guys for sharing it and telling your story with the world. Cool. Thanks very much, Stephanie.